good afternoon from Glasgow, and rest of the world, good morning and good evening to you all. I feel privileged to be here with you all and also be part of COP26. I'm Architect Ishtiak from Bangladesh, representative International Union of Architects as a lead partner for this collaboration. UI is the only global organization representing world's architects for more than 17 year, 70 years. The UIE unites the architects from more than 100 countries with the strength and diversity of partnership. The global construction sector emits almost a third of global greenhouse gas emission and uses up to 40% of the planet's total resources. Bamboo can contribute to climate change mitigation in two pathways. First, through the forest, which acts as a carbon sink, and second, we can uh, convert it into a durable products and store carbon, as well as resulting a suitable alternative number of emission sensitive material. UIA in INVAR, International uh, 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 Bamboo and Ratan Organization, joined in action in partnership and proposed this uh, Urban Day at COP26. This is build environment professionals towards a bio-based design implementation process. Architects and engineers gathered here today uh, in a diverse uh, uh, discussion across the world, and we try to uh, talk about the means to achieve the emission reduction milestone that we uh, set for 2050 through introducing climate-sensitive design solution, which would include uh, the insertion of bamboo and the built environment. We acknowledge that designing a built environment with bio-friendly material in the construction process will contribute to protect our ecosystem. It will tackle environmental pollution and boost investment in sustainable infrastructure. The very, very important thing. These are the actions that could ensure an inclusive, resilient, and net zero urban life for the benefit of all while we conserve our ecosystem protecting the diversity and assisting in the effort of mitigating and adapting to climate change. Now, I will hand over to my colleague from INBAR, uh, uh, Long, Mr. Long. Um, thank you very much, Istiak, for the introduction. And I'm Long from INBAR, International Bamboo and Rattan Organization. We are very honored to co-organize this section with UIA. And the first, I would like to invite um, our uh, INBA DDZ, um, Deputy Director General, Professor Lu Winming. He will give an opening speech uh, for this session. Uh, unfortunately, he is in China. He cannot travel here, but he already made a video record. Could you please play the video records? Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here with us today. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the INBA URA Sun event, Build Environmental Professionals Towards the Bio-Based Design Implementation Process at the COP26 Climate Change Conference in Glasgow to deli deliberate on the potential of bamboo as a sustainable construction material. Firstly, I want to thank you, our partners from the International Union of Architects, or UIA, for co-organizing this side event with INBA. This shows a commitment of architects and engineers around the world to use bamboo for sustainable construction and contributing to climate change mitigation and low carbon futures. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Bamboo and Rattan Organization, INBA, is an intergovernmental development organization that promotes environmentally sustainable development using bamboo and rattan. It is currently made up of 48 member states. In addition to its secretariat headquarters in China, INBA has five regional offices in Cameroon, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Ghana, and India. 
IMA has permanent observer status under the United Nations General Assembly and the three real conventions. Bamboo has been used as a construction material for thousands of years around the world. An estimated 1 billion people live in bamboo houses and around 2.5 billion people around the world use bamboo. Over the last 24 years, IMBA and its partners have researched, demonstrated and popularized bamboo as a modern construction material. In particular, IMBA has established a task force on bamboo construction which involves eminent bamboo construction experts, engineers and architects from around the world. Moreover, IMBA works with three technical committees of the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, as well as national and regional standard bodies to develop standards. At this year's conference, we have joined forces with our friends from Edinburgh Napier University to construct an innovative bamboo timber grid shell structure in the exhibition area. This grid shell showcases bamboo as a sustainable material in urban landscapes. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the global construction sector emits almost a third of global greenhouse gases and uses up to 40% of the planet's total resources. Bamboo can contribute to climate change mitigation in two ways. First, through its forests, which acts as carbon sinks, as well as durable products, including construction materials, that can lock in carbon for decades and replace emission-intensive materials. Because it is light, flexible, and has a high tensive, tensile strength, bamboo can also be used to create avoidable disaster resilient houses. Currently, the true potential of bamboo for low carbon construction has not yet been fully realized. But we are confident changes around the corner. Last year, the President of the European Commission, Mrs. von der Leyen, emphasized the importance of using natural materials like bamboo in construction. With this in mind, we call upon engineers, architects, policymakers, governments, donors, and international community to join hands to promote bamboo as a nature-based solution and build back better following the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I hope that today is a fruitful discussion which will lead us to tangible results and encourage everyone here to think bamboo. Thank you for your attention. I am honorable to introduce you, His Excellency, Dr. Alu Dohong. He is a Vice Minister of uh, Environmental and Forestry, Indonesia. Excellency, the floor is all. Thank you. Honorable uh, President of International Union of Architects, Mr. Jose Louis Cortes, and Honorable Inbar, Deputy Director General. Professor Lu Wenming, and distinguished uh, speakers, expert bamboo architects and engineer researchers, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very good afternoon, good morning, or probably evening, and I wish you all in very good health and this event, enjoying this event of the COP26 UNFCCC up to the end of the days. First of all, I would like to thank the INBAR and International Unions of Architects for inviting us to deliver keynote speech in this important site event and for the good arrangement for the an urban day on COP26 UNFCCC entitled Build Empowerment Professional toward the bio-based design implementation process. This event is important as part of our adaptation to climate change 
through the application of used bamboo technologies and innovation, standardization, as well as green and sustainable material. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the increasing prevalence of environmental disaster leading to human displacement, disproportional effect those with the less, at least capacity to withstand change. The intrinsic connection between shelter and well-being leads to a cycle of destruction and rebuilding in order to meet the short-term short humanitarian imperative. This results in depletion of local environmental and social ecologies that do reduce the long-term capacity of resilience. Bamboo offers one solution to this problem due to its high strength, low cost, rapid growth, and high availability within many of the disaster prone regions of the world. When utilized in the right context, it has the capacity to form part of the system of restoration rather than degradation. However, this is dependent upon number of factors, which is include availability of skills and resources and the social acceptability of bamboo to the local community. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speaker, Indonesia is home to some of the strongest tradition of bamboo crab and contemporary innovation of bamboo as a structural material. Currently, with our partners, the Environmental Bamboo Foundation, we had a movement called 1000 Bamboo Villages Program, seeks to improve the economic ecology of communities across the Indonesian archipelago through the cultivation, harvesting, and processing of bamboo. It is a supply chain that is based upon restoration rather than extraction, where bamboo comes are harvested and processed into material to construct housing. Rather than imposing on one side with sole solution, the program seeks to engage with community to utilize local resources and skills. The end result is housing that references traditional vernacular typologies, whilst also providing strong and durable outcome. By integrating social housing into a system of restoration rather than degradation, the program seeks to improve resilience of vulnerable communities through the restoration of environmental and social ecologies. Distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia, through a program fully support on bamboo development. One of the programs is social forestry policy that provides access to the community in utilization forest area with certain periodic of time that secure the tenorship and livelihood, as well as solution to tenurial or land conflicting between government and community surrounding forest area. Where area bamboo can contribute to reducing emission, control deforestation and degraded land, improving ecological and environmental functions and improve livelihood of the local people. The basic knowledge of bamboo utilization will give more benefits and increasing community welfare through a modern utilization through people, public, private partnership. Research innovation and standardization on bamboo also play important roles to support its implementation and development programs in order to find the best practices on inventory of resources, cultivation technique for each species and purposes, processing, technology, value change, economic aspects, and policies support as well. Currently, we are on progress on establishing the national strategy of bamboo development in Indonesia 
that will establish an integrated strategy as a guidance for the stakeholders involved from the upstream, middle, and downstream sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, through this forum, the speakers, the experts, expect to share the experiences, innovation, and strategies, as well as finding solutions for low emission and property alleviation bamboo base in the future by enhancing global exchange and partnership among governments, businesses, academia, and social, so, civil society organization. We believe that INBAR has a capacity and resources to support our bamboo program, such as for conducting more capacity building for farmers and our government staff regarding development of bamboo, sending INBAR experts to facilitate Indonesia and other countries members on reinventing traditional bamboo technology in the industrial context to realize modern industrial approach of the traditional processing technique and interpre interpretation. This thing is speaker, participant, and ladies and gentlemen. In closing, let me convey my best wishes and thanks to INBAR, UIA, International Union of Architects, distinguished speakers and participants. I look forward to seeing the fruits of yours and action and works growing in together. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to tell you about our session. We, UIA President Jose Luis could not yet join with us, but he will be joining and give his remarks. And we have, thank you very much to our minister uh, from Indonesia. And we have three speakers from UIA, the architects, Saif, and the Meti and Andrew will have detailed introduction later. And we have six speakers uh, from INBAR, Professor uh, David, then Johnson, and then Edwin will speak, uh, the engineers and architects together. And I would ask that because uh, we have time limitations, so we try to stick to our time, uh, six to seven minutes time, and then we will have a good uh, question answer session. And our uh, colleague, uh, my partner, uh, Natalie Mosin uh, from UIA will uh, do the uh, Q&A and also the conclusion session. Now I'd like to ask our first speaker from UIA, uh, Saiful Hawk. Let me introduce uh, Mr. Saif. Uh, Saiful Hawk is an architect based in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and is involved in practice, research, and education. His works include residential, institutional, and industrial facilities in Bangladesh. It has been published and exhibited in and outside Bangladesh internationally. I will welcome uh, architect Saifulok for Bangladesh. Thank you, uh, Ishtiak. Uh, and thanks to the organizers of this forum uh, for inviting me. And as Ishtiak has mentioned, I'm an architect working in Bangladesh. And I have to mention here that I'm not an expert on bamboo or bamboo construction, but one of our works was constructed with bamboo that was selected as a winner of the 2019 Aga Khan Award for Architecture, and also received the FIBRA Award for Bio architecture in the same year from France. The work is a modest preschool of an experimental nature and was possible to realize because of the enthusiastic support received from the client. As the work has been well publicized, I'm not including any images in this brief statement of mine. 
The jury citation of the Aga Khan Award makes reference to climate change besides other aspects of the project. Our design resulted out of the particular site condition, and that is of the typical condition of the Bangladesh floodplains. The floodplains remain flooded during monsoon and dry during the rest of the year. Our intention was to develop a design that could respond to this particular dynamic condition of this site. We considered three options. One was raising the land above the known flood level, one building on stilts, and the third option of building an amphibious structure. After comparing relative merits and demerits of the options, the client settled for the amphibious option. Though it was an untested model, but it offered an opportunity of trying out an innovative solution. The work after completion fared quite well for five monsoons, requiring routine maintenance. But unprecedented floods of last year added with COVID-19 restrictions on movement, extensive damages were caused that will require rebuilding of the world. And we are mobilizing for that. The events of last are no doubt a setback, but at the same time a learning experience that will help us identify the weaknesses and having them addressed in the rebuilding. As we have gathered here to discuss bio-based construction, I can share a bit of our experience in building with bamboo. Bamboo was chosen as the main construction material for cost and weight. We use bamboo in both conventional and non-conventional way. Though we adopted basic preservation measures, we could not fully prevent decay, and that remained a problem. The structural design also became an issue, as most designers are more familiar with designing for masonry, reinforced concrete, and steel structures. Also, deviations from conventional construction practices required extensive on-site presence for communication with the construction crew, who for obvious reasons were not equipped to understand architects' construction documents. In popular mindset here in Bangladesh, bamboo as a construction material is considered as poor people's material and needs robust examples that can establish it as a suitable alternative to brick and concrete, the current popular materials. Although the carbon emission of Bangladesh is insignificant compared to the developed countries, but to attain the objective of becoming a developed country, it needs to have a significant amount of construction taking place in the near future, in both buildings and infrastructure sectors. Also being densely populated country, there is a need to think multi-story buildings instead of single or two-story buildings. The main challenge here is of finding suitable as well as cost-effective alternatives to brick and concrete. If Bio-based materials are the materials of future. It surely needs to overcome the limitations in comparison to the currently used ones. This requires good amount of research and testing, and that is significantly lacking here. I'm aware that much research is being done many places, but they need to be shared with countries lagging behind. And the other important thing is the transfer of technological processes of manufacturing of the alternative building materials, whose cost could be high in the initial stages. UIA, as the apex body of architects of the world, has an important role here. So do the member institutes. A collaborative working process needs to be developed that can help in overcoming the crisis we are facing. So I end my uh, brief statement with a slogan. If we are to live together on this planet, then we have to work together. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, architect Saiful Hawk. Uh, now our second speaker is 
Mati Ramsgaard Thompson from uh, Denmark. Let me introduce her. She's at Research Center on the intersection between architecture and computer science. Her focus is on profound changes that digital technology instigate in the way architecture is thought, designed, and built. In 2005, she founded the Center for IT and Architecture Research Group, CETA, at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, School of Architecture, Design, and Conservation. Amethi, your time, please. We would like to request to uh, uh, keep the time uh, five to six minutes, because we, run, we are running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. I think you should see my screen, is that? And I, I'm hoping that I am able to share screen. Yes. Yes, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here today. Um, I am uh, wanted to start the talk from a point of discussing the idea of moving from the geosphere into the sphere of bio-based materials or the biosphere of renewables. I think we have been introduced to this thought through your introductions today. Um, and when we work, we try to do this transition conceptually as well as physically. It is incredibly important to remember that biomass is itself also a limited resource. We are aware at the photosynthetic ceiling the knowledge that the planet receives an equal amount of uh, photosynthesis every, uh, or it's a constant um, amount. So the idea of just growing more uh, is not really true. It is more that we change the resources that we are growing or that we maybe become smarter about how we use agricultural waste. So, of course, we are with renewables, we enter idea of a fundamentally circular circular uh, material paradigm. If we listen to Needham in 1959, he says that the, in the uniqueness of biological materials, he says that the materials are a temporary state that lasts a few thousand years uh, at most. I think this is very inspiring because it's a little bit the temporality of architecture. But here we see materials moving through a steady state system in which uh, in, uh, inflow is exactly balanced with outflow. And this allows us to reconceive the architectural um, project as being fundamentally temporal, moving us away from an idealization of firmitas and to a new architectural ideal. And now I, st I talk from a Eurocentric uh, uh, viewpoint. So how do would we, of course, design for a bio-based material in, in with a new kind of um, uh, uh, material practice? And here, I think one of the key things we need to consider is how to formalize material behavior. Bio-based materials here, rattan and bamboo specifically, are uh, a highly flexible materials and have other structural, um, or structural principles tied to them. Um, when we come from Scandinavia, we would talk about presidents from Alva Alto. And of course, if we come from other parts of the world here, Fiji, then there are really rich traditions to look to, to how to build with bending active structures that use the material behavior of, um, of the building system. In our work, we have been looking at this over the last 10 years, trying to think about how computational methods of design and simulation can allow us to rethink the way we understand our structures and the way we understand structural principles uh, underlying them. I wanted to show a little project we did with Rattan here at the EDF Foundation in Paris. Now that we are with you specifically, Rattan is beautiful material. Um, it is highly bending. Uh, it comes, we can, we can cut it to many different thicknesses. And when we work with it, it is uh, interesting to, to construct it um, through bundling. So in the rise, we are interested uh, in these bending or uh, branching diagrams uh, from trees, allowing us to use different struts. Let's just skip here. Um, and bring together bundles of material and then understanding their bending behavior to be then able to steer the way that the material is actually interacting with itself. 
So here, the computational aspect of the project is allowing us to specify the different thicknesses and the bend, dif different bending radii, allowing us to un invent new structural systems that take into use the particular material properties that Rattan has. I think this is true for many um, uh, bio-based materials, that they are fundamentally different from the geospheric uh, materials. What we are ending up with is a, a, another kind of uh, language in which the bent, uh, the growing, and the heterogeneous um, is a fundamental concept for how to, uh, or needs to be declared. Um, in our new ERC project starting here on the 1st of December, we are looking at how to model these kinds of um, complex uh, dynamics, uh, the embedded heterogeneity and the uh, fundamental environmental responsiveness of, uh, um, of bio-based materials. Um, our aim here is to question how we can conceptualize bio-based materials, their performance, composition, and duration or durability to allow a rethinking of sustainable design practice and how this new conceptualization, in effect, can transform our construction uh, practice. And as a particular aside, I think one of the key things here is obviously the temporality, the temporality of the materials as they exist in our nature and the temporality as they exist in our built environment, as they decay, as they rot. They live in different ways and we need to treat them in different ways. We have to simply think of the temporality of our buildings very differently as when we build in uh, geospheric materials. But we also have to consider what it means to live and how the idea of constructing and continual, continually constructing our built environment around us and participating in these construction practices um, can become a new way of thinking about what it means to uh, live in, within an environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mete. Uh... Our first speaker, we didn't show the image. This was a nice amphibian house with made it bamboo. And Mete, thank you very much for sharing with us this uh, advanced technological process you have gone through with bamboo. Now, our uh, next speaker from uh, UIA is uh, uh, James Kitchen, and he will talk about uh, uh, Ilma Primary School by Mass Design. Uh, James joined in Mass Design in 2017. Uh, since he led structural design of Ellen Jens campus of the Dean Fossig uh, Guerrilla Fund and co-authored the Rwanda Standard for Adobe Construction and forwarded global research in embedded carbon reduction. He has the expertise in climate positive building design and works with non-conventional material. Welcome, James Kitchen. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen well. Let me... So I'm not going to give an introduction to our organization, but I'll briefly introduce the approach um, that we use to deliver projects that are climate positive, um, protect and enhance biodiversity, and uh, provide life-changing benefits to the communities that we serve. And we call this uh, approach performance and provenance. So we design projects that are impactful, uh, efficient, and healthy. We use evidence-based research and strategies with proven outcomes. And these outcomes are often focused around improving the well-being of the users, regenerating natural ecosystems, and reducing natural resource consumption. Uh, where our materials come from matters, and, uh, and how they're made matters too. We maximize the positive social and environmental impacts through our material selection, prioritizing climate positive materials made using ethical labor. And we understand that our buildings are going to be here long after we will. So we're not just designing for now, we're designing for the end of life too. And I'll introduce um, this project, Alima Primary School. Uh, it was designed around the intersection between an ecological and a human habitat. Slash and burn methods of clearing forests for the planting of agricultural crops was putting stress on populations of bonobo monkeys, which survive in the Congo Basin. In an effort to mitigate the encroachment and support communities living 
on the borders of a species at risk of extinction. The Africa Wildlife Foundation invested in conservation education, including the youngest members of the forest. And I didn't mention, but this project is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the site is incredibly remote. This is the biggest design constraint. You can see um, that it's one day motorbike journey to Monpono to the west. And from there, it's a one month journey by barge uh, down the Congo River to Kinshasa. So once, when these are your access to typical construction materials, you really start to look at the resources around you. So due to this constraint, 99% of materials by weight were sourced within 10 kilometers of the site, and very small amounts of cement and steel were brought in from Kinshasa. Earth for walls and wood for roofs were the two largest quantities of materials. This one has 11 participants, including, every, you know, like, I think we're going to have more than that. But Earth made up 93% of the materials by weight, and most of the soil came from an enormous termite mound near the site which locals know to be the best source of material for earth construction. The blocks don't contain any chemical stabilizer and, and are hand pushed into molds like you can see on the floor on the right. And this is a very typical adobe construction. Uh, they're covered with leaves to protect them from the rain, wind and sun. Uh, Alima is, one of the, is in one of the biggest forests in the world. So using wood as a building material was the obvious choice. The, Forest is incredibly dense and stories of people getting lost was very common. We used a species of wood called ilfake, uh, which was identified as the most appropriate construction material due to its abundance, natural resistance to insects and structural properties. Even though the forest is vast and dense, the people of Alima knew which parcels of land belonged to which family. And as you can see, it was a significant physical effort to cut and transport the wood, turn them into structural elements like trusses and then lift them manually into place. It's difficult to see site that like trees of this size felled for construction because you know that is a habitat for animals. But this hyperlocal and controlled construction allows us to select individual trees within a forest, ensuring that impact to the ecosystem is kept as a, kept to a minimum, and it's able to recover. And the wood wasn't just used for structural materials. It's used, like we used the whole tree, and that included um, wood shingling for the roofs. So these traditional materials and local fabrication led to significant reduction in embodied carbon. And this number does not include any biogenic storage. Uh, locally making the earth blocks by hand um, had a, a negligible carbon impact and the only fossil fuels used during construction were from transportation of the materials and a chainsaw to cut the timber. Um, the majority of the embodied carbon in this building is still associated with steel and cement. So using hyper-local fabrication of construction materials is not just good for the climate change, but also allows the designers and builders to control the environmental impact because you can witness every tree that is felled and every pit that is dug. And that connection with our building materials is something we've lost when we live in cities. So like some cities are starting to reconnect with um, agriculture and farming, I believe that we need to start to reconnect with how our construction materials are made. And the hyper-local construction also meant that most of the money went directly into the local community, especially into skilled labor. As well as the positive economic impacts, there are also educational benefits through the upskilling of labor and emotional benefits through the community, uh, because the community can create something that they feel proud of. And one of the reasons why I work in the Kigali office in, in Rwanda is so important is due to the huge amount of construction expected in Africa in the next 40 years. Uh, I've not seen enough investment in money or effort to support sustainable African construction. And if we continue to build using the same methods, materials and mindsets uh, that we have seen over the last 100 years, then we'll never limit climate change. We also need to acknowledge that the most vulnerable countries to climate change are not the causes of it. Um, and this village and others like it are the steward, uh, where the stewardship of our planet's last intact ecosystems begin. They have the ability to protect these forests for all of us and for the fauna within them, but we need to support them to do so. Thank you. James, you have only one minute. Oh, thank you, James. Uh, it's it's good that we, we, 
we have uh, gone through three experiences from Bangladesh, from Congo, and from uh, uh, Copenhagen. Now I turn uh, my mic to my colleague from INBAR, uh, Mr. Long, to introduce his speaker and uh, 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 go for the second part of my session, our session with uh, our engineers on the bamboo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Istiak. Um, the next speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. David Tujelo. Dr. David is an assistant professor at Coventry University. He is also chartered uh, structural engineering engineer specialized in bamboo and timber. He is chair of the INBA Task Force on uh, Construction Task Force. And he is a co-author of so many uh, publications, more than 35 publications. As well. Today he will speak with us about bamboo as a mainstream construction material. Dr. David, it's your turn. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to talk about, uh, about bamboo as a mainstream construction material. Uh, there are going to be three of us from the INBAR Bamboo Construction Task Force. It's a voluntary organization that supports INBAR in its objectives. Uh, we are going to be, in this presentation, touching a bit about two of those objectives around our development of international standards and advocating for bamboo construction being mainstreamed. I'm going to be briefly explaining a bit about bamboo in case you don't know. One of the things is it's a giant grass, it's not a tree. There are over 1,600 species in the world, and it's native to all continents except Antarctica and Europe. Bamboo grows mainly in a vegetative manner. That means through the expansion of its root network. It's, some people state that it can create large root networks of up to 100 kilometers within a hectare. This root network then feeds uh, the stems or culms that emerge from the ground and they can grow very quickly. Some species can grow up 25 meters in three to four months. And that stem from the moment it emerges, it's ready to harvest within three to five years. Only some stems will be harvested every time, which means that the majority of the forest remains. And if you've got a green field and you planted bamboo from scratch, you'll have a forest in about 10 years. So why bamboo? Because it's got a lot of sustainability credentials. It's a rapidly renewable resource. It can reduce pressure on primary forests by replacing other forest products. It may make a more efficient use of land than trees. And due to continuous production of stems, it provides a haven for species of flora and fauna without affecting it during harvesting. And if you make permanent products from bamboo, it can act as a carbon sink. Its root network also acts as a carbon sink, as well as helping it control for, against erosion and regulate the water cycle. It can also help to de re restore degraded soils. It needs minimal fertilizers and pesticides when being created, uh, planted, and can act as a windbreak. And of course, all this can, be, be, can become a source of income to rural communities. Here is just a, one publication produced by IMBA that presents the different cycles of a bamboo species and a Chinese fir. And you can see in the chart on the right hand side that over time, in a hectare, more carbon is sequestered than against, when compared against the Chinese fir. Here's an exercise I undertook. And really, the point I'm trying to realize, point here is the difference in comparing in terms of two sections that do more or less the same role in bending, one made out of steel and one made out of bamboo. They have the same functional purpose. They can do the same job, fundamentally. But uh, the bamboo, without considering sequestration, would have a seventh nearly a seventh of the carbon footprint of the steel section. And that is because bamboo, as it's been mentioned, is a very strong material. I'm also wanting to tell you a bit about how we build with bamboo. 
One uh, simple way of building with bamboo, it's a technique that is called composite bamboo shear walls or bareque en cemental, is a technique that's been developed in Latin America and introduced recently to the Philippines and is demonstrated to be a very resilient technique for, against disasters. But you can also build much larger structures, like this one in Indonesia or this one in China. In all those three projects, they have had contributions from members of our task force. Now, what are, is the task force working on? We are working in the development of standards alongside ISO. We have already published three standards around bamboo culms, and, I'm not checking my standards, and uh, ISO 22156 is one of those that I'm going to be telling you more about. We're also working towards engineered bamboo standards, which is our other current projects. Why is ISO 22156 so important, structural design? Because it's the first bamboo-specific standard uh, that is of that's been developed internationally. It reflects the peculiarities of structural product observed internationally, experimentally, and experientially over decades. It has, though it has no natural jurisdiction, it needs to be adopted and adapted nationally. Only applies to structures whose primary structure is made from bamboo, stems or shear walls, systems made of bamboo stems. So it does not apply to engineered bamboo. It applies to one and two story residential, small commercial, institutional, and light industrial buildings not exceeding seven meters, similar to those that I've shown you. And compliance, of course accompanied by due diligence by an engineer, should lead to durable and disaster resilient structures. In order for us to progress further, we are going to continue working on standards. We're going to promote nationally these standards so that they're adopted. We are going to be developing manuals explaining how to adopt the standards. We then hope to train people how to use these standards. Our invitation to you is that in universities around the world continue to research and teach bamboo. National authorities adopt bamboo standards and incorporate them into legislation. And of course, that we grow more bamboo. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us all different properties of bamboo from how it grows in the nature and how it's used at the construction material. The next one, I would like to uh, introduce you. Professor He Xinjiang. Professor He Xinjiang, or under the name, it's easy to call him, is Johnson. Uh, he is a chair of uh, structural engineering at uh, Edinburgh Napier University. His, his research is on engineers, bamboo and timber composites in construction application of multi thai uh, sensor in CV engineering study. He also is a team leader of INBA ENU, bamboo timber grid shell project that is demonstrating at the COP. Uh, Professor Floyzo. Thank you. Good afternoon from Glasgow. And my pleasure here today uh, to introduce uh, the new materials, uh, bamboo and timber composite, and then uh, to introduce some of the amazing uh, development we have done uh, so far. Uh, as we all know that uh, same as trees, uh, bamboo is another grid from nature, and then many beautiful uh, bamboo, long, long bamboo structures has been built around the world. And I guess also bamboo is the uh, also the best uh, nature materials that can be grow. Oh, sorry, can be grow on the industrial scale uh, with potential to replace the steel. And so, when we look at the timber, there was a lot of engineering timber like uh, CLT uh, Gurulam timbers uh, now in the market, and then to build many amazing structures already. So curiosity naturally will drive us to ask. Can we engineer the bamboo uh, as well, uh, bamboo as well as the uh, wood? So uh, before we answer these questions, and then uh, we may uh, like to answer uh, to ask uh, why. And 
and uh, there was many, maybe a thousands of technical uh, that answers to that. And then I'm going to take you through maybe a simple uh, that way to understand this problem. Let's look at the engineering timber, see how the engineering technology has bring around uh, wood materials uh, to a high story and uh, beautiful uh, shell structures uh, built in Norway, Australia, and France. So uh, there was a future for the engineering bamboo. So how engineering, uh, how the bamboo are engineering together? So the bamboo uh, trees are felled and then split into the strips. And then after that, they will plant into a rectangular straight strip and glue together and stack together and to form this uh, wood-like uh, materials then you can use for the construction. And then when you glue them together, you can uh, put a normal pressure, so they call a laminate bamboo, or you can put a very high pressure so they, they can, you can densify uh, the bamboo to, uh, to form this uh, densified bamboo, or we call bamboo scrimbers. So there was many engineering bamboo uh, structure has built uh, in uh, around the world already, like uh, these um, small uh, buildings uh, in Munich, and then uh, the small bridge uh, in uh, China, and then uh, the ceilings uh, in Madrid Airport uh, in, in Spain. So when we notice the bamboo and timber, they all have different uh, disadvantage and advantage as well. Say, for example, for the engineering, uh, timber, they have a very sophisticated uh, system, structural system and connection system already. So uh, for the engineering, engineering bamboo, they may not get this uh, one yet. And also, they are, although they are strong, but they may be uh, difficult to nail in. And then for the densified bamboo, also not easy to, uh, to, to, to cut a hole uh, in a building to let the ventilation pass through. So that's why uh, naturally, we can think about, can we put the bamboo and timber together? Can we engineer them together? So as a researcher and as an engineer, we don't wait. Uh, we just uh, put into actions. So here's what we have done. So we used uh, fast, equally fast grow uh, soft wood uh, from Scotland. It's a 16, C16 timber, and then we uh, put them together with the laminate bamboo to form the different shape sandwich uh, beam, eye bomb, uh, that uh, 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 bamboo timber beam, and then the double eye beam as well. Uh, and then very keen to see, once we build it, how the strengths are going to be. So we test it, so we use our equipment in the lab and test these uh, structures, here's outcomes. So we got this one, we can see clearly, uh, when you put the bamboo and timber together, uh, if put in the right way, you can achieve three times stronger uh, than the grueling timber beams. So it's e close to the hardwood, um, high hardwood uh, 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 grueling beam. So it's very strong materials. The, this material, this composite material has potential. And then can we use for struct construction now? Not yet, uh, because this is the first step. You know the strengths, but you need to know how to design it. So we continue our research uh, to find out the behaviors of each uh, single materials and then how they, act, how they work together. So we have cut these uh, materials into small pieces, uh, pieces, uh, small pieces and test them. And then hopefully we understand them more and then how, understand how they, com how they work together more. Then we can develop a design method for this bamboo timber composite uh, structures. And also we develop a very sophisticated measuring system uh, for this type of uh, uh, experiment study. And then this is uh, so far some of the uh, tests we have done in the lab, uh, maybe less interesting as this one, because bamboo and timber can work together in many ways, and then you don't need to glue them together, you can put them in a grid shell shape, and then flat on the screen, uh, flat on the ground, and then uh, later on uh, we'll uh, push them up uh, to form these uh, active bent uh, grid shell structures. These uh, structures we built uh, two weeks ago and currently is displaying in the COP26 Hall, uh, hall 5 uh, in bar pavilions. Welcome to uh, have a look at uh, these amazing structures. So final conclusion, bamboo and timber are the sustainable uh, chains gifted by the natures we shall never miss. 
And then uh, a well-engineered bamboo and timber composite structures can provide excellent structural strengths at very economic uh, cost. And then this is, uh, there are great potentials for bamboo timber composite structures, uh, not only for the regular buildings, but also for the creative architectural design, such as the shell structures. And research uh, engineering departments uh, are still yet to, to be done before this application uh, can be, uh, can be, can be a, 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 a de developed in the industrial scales. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Johnson. It's very interesting uh, study, but unfortunately we are running out of time, so I'm not going to talk about it all now. Um, the next speaker I would like to invite Dr. Edwin Chia. Dr. Edwin is a senior assistant at the, um, the chair uh, for sustainable construction, the Sweet Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. He studied on bamboo as a strategy for regenerative development. He led the development of life cycle assessment data set of bamboo bay construction material. And he also worked on strategy for carbon accounting of fat growing bio bay material like bamboo. Today he will give a presentation on carbon footprinting of bamboo based construction material and buildings. Uh, Dr. Edwin. Thank you very much, long for the introduction. Uh, just very quickly, as my colleagues already mentioned, you can use bamboo in the built environment in many different forms and shapes. And we at the Chair of Sustainable Construction and the Embark Construction Task Force have the big challenge of answering the questions on how good are these materials, how do they compare to conventional materials, and more importantly, how do we assess this, not only environmental performance, but their sustainability. Being engineers, we like to have quantitative methods. We work with the life cycle assessment approach, which is very interesting for being a holistic approach that considers many different inputs and factors uh, beyond just energy demands. We consider land use, infrastructure, and transport is a well-defined and established standard that serves as basis for many reporting and declaration schemes. And for us, it's important to think on how can we contribute to the implementation of these kind of strategies and not just reinventing the wheel all the time. Uh, it's clear it's not easy, and for materials like bamboo and other alternative construction materials, it's very difficult to be able to provide data, which is the main requirement for this kind of assessment. And thanks to collaborations with universities, with INBAR, and with the Econvent Association, we were able to develop and publish the first set of bamboo-based uh, construction materials in the Econvent database. And this is not an endpoint because we develop it in a way that is not just the data, it's a framework where future users can adapt, create, and generate new data when it's needed, that is able to represent the contextual challenges that we find in different countries. And with this data, we open also the opportunity for practitioners and producers to optimize their processes, their practices, and compare themselves with other construction materials. This is the kind of work we do, also in collaboration with the Construction Task Force, and we have shown as uh, uh, we have the beginning in different types of application, low rise and high rise bamboo in these different forms, low industrialized, high industrialized, can have a great potential to reduce their carbon footprint up to 80% just in the production phase. So this is just embedded uh, carbon. When we look further in and start looking at the life cycle through the uh, the, these materials and buildings, then we see that the potential is really explored when we go beyond the forest, when we start creating durable product products 
for the built environment. We have seen that especially industrialized bamboo has the potential to create a surplus of energy. So it's not only carbon uh, uh, energy neutral, it's energy positive. But this is not all. The environmental side is one point. We need to understand that these forests need to be planted somewhere and need to be developed into sustainable value chains where we can not only plant a forest, but create products that allow the improvement of the livelihood of the communities, that can improve the economies of the people producing it while protecting the environment. In this example, we see the investments that we require for an OPC production or an engineer production, we can do way, way better. Just to conclude, bamboo is a generative, regenerative construction material. The more we do, the better we do, not only for the environment, but also for the people. But we need to have the development of sustainable value chains at the center of the action. Bamboo is a material where we can really spearhead a sustainable transition towards net zero build environment. And most importantly, we can do it now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Edwin. Thank you very much. We have heard from uh, three of our, of our speakers from INBAR. Uh, we got only uh, 10 minutes left. So we'd like to have a vibrant discussion, and, uh, and we will listen to our uh, president, Jose Luis, when we get connected. And uh, let me introduce Natalie Mosen. She will uh, lead the Q&A session. Natalie Mosen specializes in innovation in construction and sustainable development in the built environment. As head of the Institute of Royal Academy, uh, Danish Academy, Institute of Architecture and Technology, past president of Danish Association of Architects and Region 1 Vice President of, Union of International Union of Architects. Natalie is a leading voice in setting the agenda of architecture contribution to sustainable development in both strategic and political level. Natalie, I'll, I'll ask you to uh, start the conversation and um, as a vibrant, or also you can make the conclusion. And if you can connect our uh, president, Jose Luis, then we will uh, ask him to speak. Natalie, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll just uh, ask, it looks like the president maybe is coming through. Should we make sure to hear his comment uh, before I uh, conclude and maybe? Yeah. Would that be OK, Ish? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jose, can you hear us? OK, let me introduce uh, arch, uh, architect Jose Luis, uh, UIA president. He was, uh, he's an academician and also an, uh, uh, a practicing architect. He was, uh, in, in past, he was uh, into different capacities. He served UIA. And he was the past uh, Federation of College of Architects of Mexican Republic, uh, uh, FCARM's president also. So I welcome uh, Jose. We are in the last uh, uh, 10 minutes. We'll start the discussion. Before that, we'd like to hear from you uh, some remarks. Jose Luis, please. We, we can't hear you. Can you unmute, please? Can you hear me? Yes, you hear we me? can hear. Yes, please. Okay, good afternoon to everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you. You know, as you know, uh, I want to give the... Uh, I'm very happy to be today in this COP26 meeting, and I congratulate all of you for your presentations, wonderful presentations. I congratulate all the speakers that have been invited by UIA and the speakers from IMBA. I think this alliance is, is, is very successful. and. Uh, as you know, we have been very much working uh, together with the United Nations uh, in this program 2030, and uh, we, we have to work hard. We have a very high responsibility all together. So I encourage you to 
keep uh, together with UIA, working during this the, this year and the next year and so on, because uh, if we are together, we can find uh, better solutions for uh, mitigating, you know, these uh, problems of climate change and helping to uh, our planet to be in a better condition. As you know, we, ha we have been spoiling uh, uh, many of the nature everywhere in the world, you no know, contaminating rivers, lakes, sea, and and the quality of air. But I, I, am, I really believe that uh, if we put some targets year by year, we can reach uh, a better standard of living for everybody. So I don't want to take too much time because I know you, you have a lack of time. I just want to uh, say that uh, it's, it is very important that we uh, get into the near future you know, in more research. I think new materials, you know, are really relevant for the future. And uh, the level of sanitation will be very important as well. You know, uh, if we have water supply, we have sewage, if we have uh, garbage disposals, then we can raise the level of sanitation and the emplacement of uh, every construction, because many of the houses around the world are not uh, in, in the right place. They are, sometimes they are built in the places that are not proper for urban development. So we have to find out uh, the right orientation with good uh, uh, isolation, good ventilation, you know, and the, the good materials. So uh, my best regards to all of you, and I wish you very much success during COP26. Thank you. Uh, given that uh, we have only seven uh, minutes left, we'll have to uh, take uh, what uh, you said, Edwin, that this is not an end point, very literally in the sense that they will not have a long discussion now, but we have to continue discussing. We have to continue discussing when we leave this session and go out into the COP. And, and those of you who are listening from elsewhere have to continue to discuss in your practice. What we, have, uh, what we have to discuss is the barriers, the obstacles. What is it that hinders new sustainable practice to happen? As we have heard today, there are many advantages in changing paradigmatically and deeply changing how we build. Uh, as both um, uh, Mette and, um, and other speakers pointed to, what we have had for a long period of time is a, uh, is a geo-based building industry. It's been based on excavation of, of the things we take and cannot put back. What we need to move to is bio-based, a grown architecture where how we build becomes part of a, a circular understanding of nature and becomes part of how we both regenerate uh, and create uh, human habitats and uh, beautiful surroundings even. But to move uh, to bio-based, as Meta also pointed out, we have to think about what are the material uh, abilities, both in their habitat when they're growing uh, and, um, and later when we use them, and how can we use them smart? How can we use modern know-how, modern engineering, modern architecture, modern technology to be as smart as possible and as, as uh, efficient as possible, use as little as possible, but use the right materials so that we can create an architecture of the future. Bamboo has a lot to give in this conversation. It has the strengths, it has the flexibility, it has the ability to grow fast and remain a forest while we harvest partially and continue uh, both taking and giving back to nature. But, uh, but still, it's not a widely used construction material. So we need to change practice. Some of the lectures today pointed to how it can be through standards, new, and the new ESU standard is an important step in that direction. It can be through uh, inspirational practice, as we saw uh, Saif showing this wonderful uh, Aga Khan water project from Bangladesh. And it can be through the research that uh, test and prove new knowledge. We also need governments on board and we need institutional actors. And that's also why today we are so happy to have the group of people present who have, you have heard today uh, over the last uh, a bit more of an hour, because today 
we have heard both from government, from institutional actors, from architects, engineers, both in practice and in research. And it's those forces we need to bring together. Because as Saif was saying, if we are to live together on this planet, we have to work together. There's a lot of work to be done. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that pointing forward, looking towards the next steps for a bio-based architecture, uh, a bio-based architecture that to a, much, to a higher degree employs bamboo and rattan, we'll have to uh, focus our inventions on uh, three key levels. There's a level of the project, because you can't change practice on that project level. When we are uh, working in individual projects, we have an ability as architects and engineers and as clients uh, to choose material uh, strategies, to make choices, choices that can contribute to a more sustainable practice. So the project level is not unimportant, but the project in itself is a hard place to push from. We need better frames. We need to move to the organizational level and the governmental level. And we even move to where we are today at the intergovernmental level where we insist on the need for new practices, new frameworks and adoption of new guidelines and laws surrounding how we uh, construct our world, how we construct the built environment. And with that short summary of all the interesting dis discussions today, I would like to give the word back to the moderators, uh, to thank all participants and uh, to thank the UAE and INPA. Thank you, uh, Natalie. Uh, we are at the end of the, our session. Uh, we like to uh, thank everyone who uh, worked uh, relentlessly for since last June to arrange this uh, program. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, also thank the COP organizers and INBAR and uh, 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 the, our technical team present in this room. This is a uh, very uh, interesting way we are presenting because of the uh, COVID situation is in studio. And I would like to thank all the people behind the scene uh, made it happen. Uh, 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 Mr. Long, if you'd like to have a uh, few more words, you can say. So uh, I would like to also thank uh, our EYS secretariat and our uh, uh, SDG commission, all the members, uh, and also uh, 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 in, in our uh, uh, panel discussion, uh, David, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, Edwin, Natalie, uh, Meti, uh, uh, online, and Saif, and also James, uh, and our president, uh, Jose Luis, and also Inbar uh, 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 Vice President, uh, uh, Mr. Liu Huimin, and also uh, Minister for Environment Forestry of Indonesia. Thank you very much for joining us uh, within your busy schedule. And I give my uh, last words to Mr. Long. Please. Okay. Um, th thank you very much, Ishak. Um, yes, you already um, acknowledged all of the people. I am the last thing. I feel that it's. Um, we have already had quite a good uh, knowledge from different researchers have shown us all the different capacity of bamboo that, what, that we can use it. Yeah, but however, we have uh, the time shortage. We do not have time to discuss in detail. I have several questions for them as well, but um, we do, uh, with the time limited, I cannot ask now. So I um, recommend that. After this one, we will form a group, and then we can keep in touch, discuss in detail. I'm very much interested in how we can uh, use your research to do wide, to, to, to uh, apply your research in the reality, to make it happen in everywhere in the world, to make the result of it. The research is already there. So now it's the next step in how we can make use of it for every people. And um, I would like to thank to everyone today. Uh, again, one more time, just thank you very much.